Father God, I thank you for this Sunday, Lord. I thank you that you love us so much, and I thank you for your word, God, and I pray that you would, you would open up your word to our hearts, God, and that we would be able to see you and more of you and a clearer image of you. Thank you. We pray this all in your holy, most precious name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter Kondrashoff, and I'm one of the speakers here at the English service. Today, we're going through a series called What You Didn't Know About God. And the title of this message is called The World's Best Sleeping Aid. And it, it's going to make sense a little bit later down the road. But uh, before, we, before we go into explaining all of that, I want to tell you something that happened. It was a little bit over a year ago. We got married in... Oh man, did I just forget? We got married in uh, March 12th, and we went on a honeymoon, uh, our honeymoon to Mexico on a cruise. And this, and, and we had an awesome time because this was my wife's first time ever leaving the country, uh, you know, after she moved here to America, and just first time being on a cruise ship, and she was just blown away by everything. It's like unlimited food. What is this? And then, and it's just it's so beautiful. And and I just loved like walking around and showing her all these cool things. Like, babe, check this out. So we had a great time. Then after we came back, our ship landed. We went to LA, visited our cousin who lives there, and spent some time with him and his wife. And that was a fabulous time. Then we came back to Sacramento, and we already had our apartment ready at that time. So we started moving everything in. And, you know, we're moving in. We have nothing there. I'm sitting on the floor. We had no couches. We had no table. You know, so it was a fun experience. And it, but probably, but that didn't last really long because about three days into that, Vera developed a pain in her side. And I'm like, well, just take a uh, Tylenol and, you know, have it go away. So she takes the Tylenol and it helped for four hours. But the next day, the pain was still there. It was persistent. It was dull and it was stronger. And that's when I started getting worried. Because if it doesn't go away in 24 hours, you know that you've got some other deeper issue. So I started getting worried and she's like, it's fine, it's fine. And that makes it ever, even worse because I'm like, I have no idea how bad it is, right? And so I start kind of freaking out and I'm like, man, what, what is happening to her? So I took, we took her to the ER. We end up spending six hours in the ER, com you know, uh, just completely, I, was plan I had plans for the weekend and I canceled those because I needed to be there with her. And we spent six hours in the ER. The doctors do some tests and they do a pain, so they gave her pain meds and then they, and a few hours later they did a pain test. I don't know if that makes sense or not. But, uh, and so, and they didn't check for the appendix. I'm like, well, guys, what are you doing? This is, you know, sh it could be the appendix. So they didn't do all these tests and they came back and they said, we don't know what the problem is. You need to go home and wait and see what happens. And man, that was excruciating. So we go home, the pain is getting worse. I have no idea what's happening with her. I mean, it could be her appendix is rupturing and she's going to, she's going to die in a couple of days. And, and they sent us home from there. And so... I mean, the anxiety was overwhelming, and it was just, I felt like gray hairs forming on my head. Anybody ever feel that before, just from the worries in your life? Okay, and, and so, but praise God, uh, we ended up going to the ER again 24 hours later, and the pain was getting worse, but it all worked out. But then in Thanksgiving, uh, as we were in Tahoe, okay, secluded, snowy area where you can't, like, travel outside of it, right, the perfect place to be. Uh, for uh, again, she started developing pain in her side as well. It was a different, if it was a different type of pain, and so I just, I, I still remember uh, trying to sleep next to her those nights, and I was unable to sleep because of she's sleeping, and every ten minutes there's like this grunt or like a moan or a groan, and I'm just laying there. I'm like, it's like it's like watching a baby die. I mean, you you, you can't sleep while doing that, right? And, but the funny thing is, in the morning, she's like, oh, I don't really remember any of that stuff. <laughs> I'm like, well, I remember that. <laughs> and so it, it, it actually got so bad that I said, babe, I need to sleep on the couch in a different room because, you know, I can't, I can't sleep next to you. And if it gets really bad, wake me up and we're going to go to the ER. And the crazy thing is, again, not knowing what it is, is you don't know whether you need to take her to the ER now or is that going to be too early and they're going to send you back or, or, or what, if I'm, what if I'm taking her in too late already and it, the damage has already started happening and it, the consequences are going to be irreversible and perhaps even death. And it's just this anxiety and the stress just starts coming over me, feeling so helpless and unable to make the right decision. I mean, 
I'm like, man, is this what the married life is like? I mean, it was awesome for the first three weeks. And, and, and what is happening now? And I just feel just this stress building up. And then I started thinking about the future of family life. I'm like, okay, well, if I think this is bad. Imagine having four kids and each of them having their own problems. And they're sick and the doctors don't know what's wrong. And, and they're, they're gone and they're not home and they're, they're not home and their phone is off and you can't get a hold of them. And they went on some trip and you don't know what happened. And I just like, man, do I even want kids like in light of this <laughs> perspective? And then it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And what it is that hit me, I'll tell you guys a little bit later into the message. But before we do that, I want to, I want to paint something right now. Not physically, but mentally. On the canvas of our minds. Um, and my palette is going to be a series of Bible verses. Something that God talks about himself. Feel free to close your eyes if that's going to help you really let these words sink in. About what God says about himself. And, and, and you see these words, they're... They're creative in how they describe God. And it's just a way to describe something, in particular someone that is real, a tangible power and intelligence that controls the entire physical and metaphysical world. And behind all this control stands ultimate goodness and love. So just try to picture of what we are about to read. Psalm 24 the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it and on the seas and established it on the waters. First Chronicles 29, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Job 42, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Psalm 135, whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. Proverbs 16, 1, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord has made everything for its purpose. Get this, even the wicked for the day of trouble. Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Second Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat said, O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand are power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Psalm 103, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Isaiah 45, I form the light and create darkness, the Lord says. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. And lastly, Daniel chapter 3 King Nebuchadnezzar said, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my reason returned to me and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever for his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation and all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand, none can stop his hand, or say to him, what have you done? This is the God that reveals himself in, the, in his word, the Bible. 
This is a God who has complete control. And I know the word control nowadays has this negative uh, association to it. We think control freaks, but instead substitute it with the word influence. Nothing is outside of his influence. He is never desperate or left with... um, He's never, nothing is, nothing ever overwhelms him. Everything is always moving at the pace that he needs it to move and everything is happening the way that he has determined it to happen. So let's look again, if we can get the slides going, what else does God have control over? I just want to be biblical. I want to give us the passages of what God gives us. I don't want to give us what I think, but what, what he says about himself. We see that he has complete control over the universe. He holds the universe by the word of his power. We see, next slide, that every single word that you have ever heard or ever said is from him. It says the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. We know that every nation that... He, has ever ruled the world and every nation that was crushed out of existence is also under his complete control. It says that he removes kings and sets kings up. It's not just talking about Christian kings or kings that believed in him, but all kings in the history of all the world. He is an awesome God. He is also a God who is in control and has influence over human disabilities. It says that God says, who has made the man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? He's also God over life and death. And that's why it says that the Lord kills and brings to life. He says, I kill and make alive. I wound and I heal. He has power over all of this. And lastly, essentially God is, he has power over everything. And that's why Job says, I know that you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Purpose means no plan of yours. Nothing that you have thought up and want to do can ever be stopped. Thwarted means stopped, frustrated, halted. Nothing can be thwarted. God has complete control, complete influence over the entire universe. And I hope we see this because this is what he reveals in his word. Now I know we run into a problem when we talk about this topic because we talk about, well, well, if God's in complete control, where does my will come in? Do we even have free will? And I promise you we're gonna, we will touch upon this topic and we're going to look at it but for, uh, and we're going to look at it later in this message. But for in, in the meantime, I want to go back to that, the story I was telling you about, the, the whole medical situation. And what it is that dawned on me in that moment as I was walking around, pacing around my living room, just stressing out, generating gray hairs. What happened? What did I realize? What I realized is, man, if, if it, this is bad and with kids it's going to get even worse, how did, how did my mom do it? Well, you know, like, I mean, we were a bunch of crazy kids and we put her through a lot of all kinds of stress, and so how did she survive up to the age that she survived? Because I don't remember her being a particularly stressful woman and a woman who's full of anxiety. I don't remember that. And I'm like, well, did she love us? Yeah, of course she loved us. She cared about us, and she loves us like crazy, and I love her back as well. I know we all love her. So if she loves us and she cared about us, but she didn't stress out, what was it? And then it dawned on me. I remember that she trusted the will of God completely. And I remember her telling us numerously, saying, no matter what happens, I know it's all in God's hands. He's like, you know what? God might take your youngest sister, right? The favorite one. She, she didn't say that, but I know that's what she meant. She said, God can take her at any time. And it's okay because it's in his will. Is it going to be a time of sorrow? yes. Are we going to be sad? But you know what? It's all in his will. I trust him. And it doesn't matter how much protection we try to put around her. If it's his will to take her, he will take her. And no matter what kind of circumstances she faces, no matter how dangerous something happened, you know, a car accident, if God wants her to stay, she will stay. And that's what I realized in that moment, that I trusted God mentally. I knew that he was in complete control mentally, in theory, but in practice, my heart did not believe that in that moment with my wife because I felt like I had to make, you know, I had to make that decision to, you know, if I make it too early, it might kill her. If I make it too late, it might kill her. And I need to get the sweet spot and I have no information of how to make the right decision. And that was killing me. And then I realized, you know what? God is in complete control. 
And if he wants her to stay here on earth, if he wants my marriage to last more than, you know, eight months, he will keep her no matter what, and he will give me the wisdom to make the right decision at the right time. And even if I make the wrong decision, and the doctor still don't know what needs to happen, and she dies, he could bring her from the dead if he needs to. He did that before. And if he doesn't want her to stay, no matter how good of a doctor we get, he's still going to take her life. And then that's when that peace rolled over me. And I realized that God has complete control. And that's when I was able to just sleep at night normally, knowing that he would lead me into making the right decision for that situation, no matter what was happening around and so what I want to talk about is why is God's sovereignty? And God, sovereignty is just a big fancy word to mean supreme authority or supreme control, supreme influence over the universe. Why God's sovereignty is such a big deal. So the first reason of why God's sovereignty is such a big deal to us is because there is no need to be anxious anymore. When you believe it in your heart, you can have the peace that he provides through his sovereignty. God's sovereignty is also a big deal because it completely changes our perspective on life. Romans chapter 8 verse 28 says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So that means everything. When it says all things, it means literally everything. What does it mean? Everything. Can you say that one more time with me? What does it mean? Everything, right? That means all things, everything that happens to you, every situation, every circumstance that has ever happened, every bad word that was spoken to you, every evil thing that was done against you, every accident, every act of bad luck, everything is working together for your good. That, it's not, that verse is not saying that that thing in it of itself is good. But it's working together. It's like a mosaic and it's a piece of the puzzle that when you step back and you look and you're like, wow, that is beautiful. Yeah, that might be a little dark spot in my life, but when you step back, it all comes together and it is for your good if you love God. And so what's amazing is this can change the way we pray. You see, there's some people that pray like this. Lord, please give me this. Then there's other people who pray saying, Lord, Please give me this if this is your will, right? I mean, that's the right way to pray, to surrender to the will of God. But I think we can even go one step further to change our perspective is to say, Lord, please give me this if this is going to work together for my good. Because whatever works together for my good is your will. And that changes the way we surrender to God's will because when we realize God's will is not against us, but it's for us. And it's working for us for our good. Amen? So let it change the perspective of your life if you love God. That is the number one key claim and the number one thing to that. That's the key phrase. Another reason why God's sovereignty is such a big deal is because it means that our life has purpose. You're not just living your life trying to get by and you do this and then you get into a freak car accident and you're paralyzed from neck down. And what was the point of that? If it's all completely up to you, well then, sorry, you're just a victim of bad luck and you need to just deal with that. I mean, might as well just kill yourself. What hope do you have? But when you realize that God is in complete control, you know that he has a purpose in every single thing that happens, no matter how horrible or atrocious. Because there's somebody who's using everything in your life for his glory and your good. God's sovereignty is a big deal because it means that we do not need to fear. It's like knowing how a movie's gonna end. Imagine you're walking into this movie and someone walks out and is like, yeah, man, he won, that hero survived, he totally you know, beat the bad guys and he made it out alive. You're like, well, thanks. You ruined the movie for me. But if you think about it, the, it ruined it because you're no longer into it as much. Because you, you no longer believe that, you know, like, oh, maybe he's gonna die. No, you know, you know that everything's gonna be okay, right? But for, in life, that helps a lot, actually, you know, because we don't, it's already intense enough, you know, you're going up and down, up and down, and we need to know God's sovereignty, that he, in, he's working through all of this. You see, no matter, you see, what makes a movie great is that the main, you know the main hero will succeed, but the movie makes you believe that he might not, right? 
But what makes our life a life of joy and peace is knowing the fact that God will not abandon you and leave you no matter how much life tries to make you believe that he will. And that is why sovereignty is so important for us. Another reason why sovereignty is such a big deal is because it means that being free from anxiety and fear is no longer optional. It's not optional. Some fascinating statistics about anxiety from anxietycenter.com. I think they pulled it from another study. It says, anxiety has become the number one mental health issue in North America. It is estimated that one third, can you believe that? One third of the North American adult population experiences anxiety and wellness issues. And another quote is, people with anxiety disorder are three to five times more likely to go to the doctor and six times more likely to be hospitalized for psychiatric disorders than the non-sufferers. Five times more likely to go to the doctor. Six times more likely to be hospitalized for psychiatric disorders. You see, understanding what we just looked at from God's word, we no longer have the option to live in anxiety. Because if you are, if we are, if I am, when I live in anxiety, that means I'm either not believing that God has complete everything in, under complete control or I believe that he's not totally good and he's not totally for my good. And what I'm not saying is you can't have any anxiety. It, anxiety is another sin, just like any other sin. But the question is, are you just letting it overwhelm you and just eat you up? Or are you fighting it by trusting in the Lord? That's the question. You see, anxiety is just like any other sin. It's just as bad as pride. It's just as bad as being selfish or, or cocky or adultery or theft or slander. That is what anxiety is. It's one of those sins. It's not trusting God. Just imagine this. Imagine the closest person in your life. The person that you both, you know, you trust one another most, right? And if, if you don't have that person, just imagine somebody that you both trust completely, right? And, and everything's great. And then all of a sudden, they just stop trusting you. They're like, yeah, you know, not, not with this. And you're like, what? I mean, how offensive would it be? And you're like, why? I never did anything to break your trust. I never let you down. Why would you all of a sudden stop trusting? I mean, it's, it's an insult, right? When people don't trust you. I mean, it's an insult when you did screw up and you don't deserve to be trusted. But when you didn't do anything wrong and someone just stops trusting you, I mean, it's absurd. But that's what we do to our heavenly, lovingly Father, our loving Father. when we don't trust him. So not only is anxiety bad for you and your health, but it's also bad for you and your soul and your relationship with God. Anxiety is a sin, and that's why knowing what we know as Christians, or maybe you're not a Christian, but hearing about this God who has complete control and he is completely good, knowing that anxiety is no longer optional for us, and lastly, God's sovereignty is a big deal because it changes our view of God. You see, in an organization or a country or a kingdom, who is typically more important, the king or the cook? The king or the cook, guys? The king, right? Why is he more important? Because he has more control. He has more influence. He has more say of what happens in the kingdom. I'm not saying anything bad about cooks. One of my really good friends is a cook, Yuri Matushko. So I love you, man. Um, but when we realize that God has complete control over all things, it really shifts the perspective from us and our life to God and his glory. Do you, are you following me? When we realize that he is the one that's actually in complete control and he has more influence than we will ever have, put together, multiplied by an exponent of 10, God becomes at the center of everything. We realize that he is the king and we are the cook. 
God is no longer inside of a little box, a little neat, convenient box that you put into the back of your pocket and you pull it out when you need, like a little pokeball, right? See, he doesn't have this set of rules that he always must obey. He has rules that he binds upon himself, but he doesn't have these rules that we can make up and God is going to follow them all the time. You know, two plus two will always equal four. If I, if I do this to God, he will always do this to me, right? And he just has to because he's obligated. No, that is not how God works. He is so much beyond us. We are the ones in the little box. We are the ones limited and constrained by his words and actions instead of him being constrained by our words and actions And he does hear prayer, and he loves us, and he will answer our prayers, but he is not obligated. He is not a math formula that just, he's not some computer software that just runs automatically. There's an article by Pastor Keith Lee, great article. I just got a little excerpt out of it. He says, one of our problems today is that we have lost the biblical perspective of the majestic greatness of God. We have a completely wrong focus of God. As J.B. Phillips points out in his book, Your God is Too Small. He says that people today see God as one, the resident policeman, right? Just wants to bust you for everything. You're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong. B, he's the grand old man. Or C, a parental hangover. Or some other short-sighted, twisted view of God. The sovereignty of God may be defined as the exercise of his supremacy, his infinite rule, his authority and power being infinitely elevated above the highest creature in authority, nature, and being. He is the most high Lord of heaven and earth and all creation. Basically, God's sovereignty means that he is the supreme ruler who personally rules over all the affairs of the universe. Translation, God is sovereign, and it is a big deal because it brings our perspective onto him, and we realize that he is sitting at the center of all this, that he is the sun, and we are the planets, the meteorites, the comets that revolve around the sun, and it is all about him because just like the sun gives life to all the earth, so he gives life to everything else here on earth. And so all that being said, we know that the sovereignty is a big deal. But the elephant in the room is, is the big elephant in the room is asking a question. He's saying, so we don't need to do anything, right, Peter? If God is in complete control, the movie's already pre-scripted, everything's predetermined, we don't need to do anything, right? Because God's going to do it anyway. Nothing can stop him. I mean, if he wants to save people, he's just going to go and save people. He doesn't need my help. He doesn't need need me to do anything. False. That is false. It's not true. Now, we need to realize that this topic has actually been debated for thousands of years by philosophers, ancient philosophers. I mean, if you study Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they all struggled with this problem, like not Christians. And and if you type into Google, do we have, and then you look at the suggestions that it has, one of the top suggestions is free will. This is People who are not Christian, neurologists, psychologists, physicists, they're all, everyone's debating whether we have free will or if everything's just like this math formula that's, un, uh, you know, unraveling, right? It's all the molecules moving around. And if we knew all the aspects and different variables, we'd be able to predict how everything's going to happen. People have been debating since the beginning of humanity, and I think they will keep debating But what I want to do is I want to see what the Bible says to us about these topics. Not what people say, but what does God reveal to us, right? So we've seen that God is in complete control. Amen? I mean, we've seen that, those passages. I mean, you can't interpret them any other way. And and I actually, Pete forced me to shorten it down because there's just so many Bible verses uh, that talk about this. And it's just about... All, and you can Google it. I mean, you can read all of it, how he is sovereign over all the affairs of men. I mean, just everything, everything that people do. But yet, we also see in the Bible that there is such a thing as human responsibility. 
that there is such a thing as free will and that we have to do things. So first, we see in the Bible that we must try our best. Bible verse for that, Ecclesiastes chapter 9. It says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. We have to try our best, no matter what we're doing. Bible also says that we must think. Philippians chapter 4 says, think about these things. And Paul actually says that we need to think about the Bible. In 2 Timothy, he tells Timothy, he says, think about these things that I'm writing to you, and the Lord will give you understanding in everything. He doesn't say, the Lord will give you understanding, don't worry about it, man, just go do your thing. He says, think about it, and then the Lord will give you understanding in everything. We must act, we must think The Bible is full of commands that we need to act upon. Galatians chapter 6 says, And let us not grow weary of doing good. Doing good is an act, and we are commanded to do it. Again, it's human will, human responsibility, and we will be held accountable whether we did these things. And we must also pray, right? If you think, well, if God's got it all figured out, he's going to know what's going to happen, who's going to get saved, what's not. Do we even need to pray? Do we need to even ask for things? I mean, if God knows he's going to, you know, fix this situation, why should I pray? You know why we need to pray? Because God says, ask and you shall receive. In Luke 6, Jesus says, pray for those who abuse you. So we see these two, like, seemingly contradicting worldviews, both in the Bible. And the question is, how can both of them be true? And I love the answer what one preacher said. He said, when, when they asked him, like, so is it God's will or human will? Like, what, what trumps what? what? What is, you know, which one, which one is the, you know, the ultimate one? Is it human will or God's will? And he said, great question. And the answer to that is yes. <laughs> He's like, it's God's will and human will. And the reality is, is that no, we, I don't know. That's the answer. That's my short answer. I don't know how both of these can be philosophically and logically true. But what I do know is that God reveals this to be true and he reveals this to be true. And it's not a theory that I made up. It's something we see in God's word. And if you're confused, don't blame me because I didn't write these verses. And I, what I think it is, and you're like, oh, you're leaving me hanging, Peter. This is, this is, and this is not fair. I'm going to walk away confused. What I think it is, is that I think this topic of human will and God's will, predestination, call it whatever you want. I think this, we see that they're both true in the word of God. And we can't reconcile them because I think we, in trying to reconcile them, we are reaching the limits, the outer limits of human reason. For example, I don't know if you've ever watched like a video about like comparing the different dimensions of the world. There's like a, there's a zero dimension that's like a point in space, like math geeks, you'll understand this. Second dimension, uh, sorry, first dimension is a line. It's just how long it's going, right? 2D is everything's flat. Like when everything you see on the screen, it's all 2D. There's no 3D, even though it might look 3D, but it's not 2D. 3D is our world right now. But now imagine that you are a 2D character who lives in a cartoon. Imagine you're on a screen and you're living. Well, you can go, you can go this direction. You, you, know, you can go forward, you can go backward, you can go up, down, but you can't go in and out of the TV, right? But you as a 3D object, you can come up to this TV and you could like, you know, stick your finger into this 2D world and all they're going to see is that slice of your finger that goes into your 2D world. And, And that 2D object's mind will just like pop if it tries to understand the 3D object. And I think there's something similar going on here. We, we are, we are living in a 3D world. Well, it's more D's, but we perceive the world to be 3D. And we cannot reconcile how God's sovereign will comes together and can live together and exist together with human will and human responsibility. We can't see that. As one preacher said, it's like two columns going up into heaven. We see both of them, but we can't see where they meet because it's covered by the clouds. 
What another preacher said, I, I love this. He says, just trying to make sense of it, he says, God is in control, not the way a human would control another human, right? If I was in control of you and I forced you to do something bad, it would be my responsibility because I forced you. I took over your will. I consumed your will. I coerced you and you did it. So it wasn't actually your will doing it. It was my will doing it, right? That's how we control one another. We manipulate and control. So it's actually, there is no, there two wills existing. There's only one. But what he says, there's a verse in Isaiah 55, 9. He says, God says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. This relates right back to that 2D, 3D world. Just as the heavens, the heavens, the stars, the galaxies, just as they are higher than the earth, so there is this great gap between your logic and your understanding, your thoughts and my thoughts. And so God can control, God can have his sovereign will over all the universe without removing or eliminating human will. And he knows how to do it. Go figure, I don't. I don't, I don't. Guys, I do not have the answer to this. I'm just being honest, but I'm just showing you what the Bible gives us. And you know what's interesting is you're thinking, well, no, this sh it shouldn't be this way, right? You know, it all needs to make sense in Christianity. We need to have everything in perfect little boxes, right? Well, then explain to me the Son of God, the Son of Man right? How much percent was he God? How much percent was he man? Guys, shout out answer. How much percent was he either one and the other? A hundred both of them, right? Well, great. I'm glad you got the answer right, but now explain to me how that makes sense. Explain to me. You can't. I've, tr I've tried like thinking about it. You can't explain it, but you know what? We don't stumble over this reality because it's convenient. Like, great. I get... You know, I get both the best worlds. He's God all-powerful and he's man who can sympathize with us. I love it. It doesn't create a moral dilemma for us. But this one, this question of God's will versus our will does. And that's why we trip over it. Or for example, the Trinity, right? How can God be three persons in one and still be one God? I mean, people tried to explain it, but we can't. But, and it doesn't create as big of a moral dilemma as God's will versus our will does. So we actually, we're okay with these questions. It's when it creates a moral dilemma. And, and, and just to encourage you, you can't teach calculus to a second grader. You can't do that. Their minds just literally will not grasp it. Just, it's like right up here and they're just trying to grasp it and they can't because you need all these different layers of knowledge in order to get up on these layers in order then they can grasp it. And that's the same thing with us in this philosophical debate. That's why we keep debating about it for thousands of years. And if you want to find more of these, just find the things that people argue about for thousands of years and those are the limits of human reason. Now, will we ever be able to grasp it? I have no clue. My guess, probably not because it's so high up, but we all have limits to our human reason, so why, do, why can't all of humanity have a limit to human reason altogether? I mean, there's things that Einstein didn't grasp. So how do we expect to have a very clear answer to something that thousands of people have debated for thousands of years? I think most importantly, if we just take a step back from all this, most importantly, it's to remember that God is 100% good. That's the most important fact. And that there is no unfairness and no injustice on his part because that's what he claims to be true. And, and so, and, and if you can't believe this, you know, you're left with either believing he's 100% good or you're left with believing that there is some evil in him or injustice in him. And my argument is that both positions or both beliefs require the same amount of faith. They require the same amount of faith. So which one are you, you going to choose? That he's 100% good or that there is evil in him and injustice and not goodness? And 
I know what some of you are thinking, well, how does this all relate to the topic of salvation? That's like the even bigger, right, elephant in the room. And I wish we could get into this, but for the sake of time, we're going to have to leave it for another message. Maybe we could even do a whole sermon series on this, but if you guys want to chat, come up to me. Let's, we can talk about it. We can open up God's word and look at it. But in conclusion, I want to finish with one last verse out of the Bible. That is Isaiah 53, verse 10. This is a prophecy about God the Father and God the Son. And it says that, yet it was the will of the Lord, that is the Father, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. It was the will of God the Father to crush his son, Jesus. God the Father knew that Jesus would get crucified when he sent him on earth. It didn't just happen. Oh man, what did they do to my son, right? That's not what happened. It says it was the will of the Lord to crush him. In, in another translation, it actually says that the Lord was pleased to crush him. What? God, that was God's will? He wanted that to happen? He was pleased for that to happen? And the point I want to make here is that if God was sovereign, if God was over and in control of or the excruciating, the humiliating, and the unjust death of his perfect, innocent priceless, only begotten son, then how much more is he sovereign over every event in the history of the world? How much more? If, if, if that was the pinnacle of all reality and he willed that to happen, how much more is he sovereign over everything else? And I, th- and I think right here it's really important to stop and realize that Although God was sovereign over it, and although it says that it pleased him to crush him, right? It's important to remember that God does not do everything as a means to an end in itself. God does not do everything as a means to an end of itself. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. What I mean is that the Lord, the Father, was not pleased to crush the son because God is a maniac that finds joy in divine child abuse. That's not why he was pleased in that. But he was pleased in the innocent death of his only begotten son because he knew that it would result in salvation, eternal salvation instead of eternal wrath for millions if not billions of souls. That's why. God did not think the crucifixion was good, but he was using that crucifixion in the life of Christ and in our lives to, you, to have it work together for good. That was the, that's the darkest stain in human history, and God is going to use that also in the mosaic, in that tapestry of the history of the world in order to create something beautiful. And that darkest time in history resulted in the brightest time in for all of us. Because now we have hope. Because of what was produced by that death was magnified by a billion times. The greatest evil was turned into the greatest good. And that is why the father was pleased to crush his son. He knew what would happen as a result of this. So the question today is, have you trusted in what Jesus has done for you on the cross? Have you accepted his death as a payment for your sins? Have you accepted what God the Father gave you, what he willed for you? So that his wrath can be transferred from you, the wrath that you can't escape from. It's like a target on your back that you can't run from. Have you, let, have you trusted God so that that could be transferred onto Christ, which he already paid on the cross almost 2,000 years ago? Have you accepted that payment on your behalf? Because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not a guarantee. You don't even know if you're going to live until the end of today, and this is a fact. You probably will but you might not because today is the day of salvation and are you going to join God 
and love him and become a part of those for whom all things work together for good. Because if you don't love him, all the things that happen in your life are not working together for your good. They're not. It's all going to work into your doom. Even the things that you think are good are not working together for your good if you do not love your creator. And if you have already trusted God for your eternal salvation, my question is, are you living a life of trust? Or in other words, how big is your God? How big is your God? And I'm not asking, do you agree with me that God has everything in his hands? That's not what I'm asking you. I'm not, uh, I'm not asking you if you agree with me that we should trust God. That's not what I'm asking. But I'm asking, are you living a life of trust? If the whole world could see your thoughts and your feelings, would they see trust in God's good, sovereign hand? Or would they see how I was when I wasn't trusting him with the situation that I was put into? Or are they going to see a life of anxiety and fear and insecurity and ultimately faithlessness to him who loves you most and who is committed to your good? I want to ask us one more time before we pray. How big is your God? Let's pray. God, I thank you. You know that I am, I'm not worthy, Lord, to be up here speaking your word. God, you know that often I, I say that I believe that everything's in your hands, and yet I don't live like that. And I just want to ask you for forgiveness, God, and I want to ask you for the strength and the clarity, God, to always hold that firmly, God, not just with my head, but with my heart, God, so that I would trust in you always. Lord, and I pray that you would grow trust in all of us, God, and that we would be able to trust in you and yet still obey what you commanded us to think, to pray, to act, to do our absolute best, knowing that you are going to take care of it all. God, I pray that we would be obedient and that we would love you, God, that we would reciprocate the love that you have showed for us and continue to show for us. I thank you. I pray bless us, strengthen us, and help us look to you, God. And if anyone, Lord, hasn't trusted in you yet, God, I pray that they would. I thank you. I pray this all in your name, Jesus. Amen.